And our next speaker is Emma Grusing. And Emma, you could go ahead and share your screen at any time. And I just wanted to say uh, that I'm really glad to see that more mineralic work is being done out there. I think one of the most basic um, but important things we can do is to document and identify where those critical areas are located on the landscape and, and share that information with land use managers. Emma graduated from Montana State University this past May where she earned her bachelor's degree in fish and wildlife management and ecology. She grew up in Elko, Nevada, but has spent the last four years in Montana where she is involved in field studies on grizzly bears, moose, bighorn sheep, and most recently sage grouse. During her senior year, she was able to conduct a research project regarding bighorn sheep and mineral use with Dr. Robert Garrett, Dr. Blake Lowry, and Jesse DeVoe as project mentors. And this project is still ongoing, but will but will be completed soon. And this is what Emma is going to be presenting to us on today, evaluating the characteristics of mineral licks used by two mountain ungulates. Ready? Thank you, Mike. Can you guys hear and see me? Okay. Yes. Awesome. So yes, as Mike said, um, I started this research when I was an undergrad at Montana State. And luckily my project advisor, Dr. Bob Garrett and my two project mentors, Blake Lowry and Jesse DeVoe um, have helped me to continue this project past my graduation. And we are still ongoing, but we'll be finishing up here in the next few months, I think. So here is my project on evaluating characteristics of summer migrations and mineral lick use in bighorn sheep. So to start off, I kind of want to explain what we actually mean by summer migrations with an elevational profile, a seasonal elevation profile of a radio collar U from our Lost Creek herd. So this individual and this herd as a whole is what we consider to be a migrational herd, which means that they winter at low elevations, as we can see on the left side of the graph here, and summer up at high elevations, like we can see at the center and over to the right with spring and fall migrations between their seasonal ranges. But what we can also see is that this U has made several short durations, about one to three days, summer migrations to low elevation winter range. She's made about three. Um, we can see this behavior across several of our migratory study herds where these individuals are seemingly traveling to the same few elevational spots per summer, as we can see in this red circle here, and with another U in our still water herd by these pairs of arrows here. When we then superimpose um, all of the elevational profiles of each collared U within a herd, we can see that um, these summer migration events are actually quite common. All of these little gray spikes down to low elevation are summer migration events that these U's have been doing during the summer months. Um, the thick black line on these graphs just represents the mean elevation of the herd at a given time. And the space between these thick red lines is what we've roughly characterize as the time that these um, sheep are on their summer range. So these summer migrations are actually observed in each of the migratory herds that the Montana Statewide Bighorn Initiative studies have been a part of, which are shown in red here. Our five study herds, um, four of them are, them are shown on this map. So we evaluated GPS collar location data from the Castle Reef herd, the Lost Creek herd, the Hill Guard herd, which we've called South Madison, the Stillwater herd, and the Upper Yellowstone herd, which should be sandwiched right here between Hill Guard and Stillwater. So what resource is important enough for these ewes to be making so many of these low elevation summer migrations? We actually have hypothesized that these migrations are driven by a lack of essential trace minerals on their high elevation summer ranges and that these ewes have traditional knowledge of the sources of trace minerals on their low elevation winter range. These two factors together, we believe are causing the root cause of these rapid movements to and from the known lick sites. So trace minerals are essential for animal health and any sort of imbalance, be it or deficiency in nutrients can be detrimental to an animal's physiological functions and can potentially decrease reproduction, survival, and overall population growth rates of the given herd. These trace minerals include calcium, magnesium, sodium, and copper, but there are actually 14 essential trace minerals that are required by um, domestic ungulates. In domestic sheep, deficiencies in the four that I just mentioned can lead to lowered body weight, a decrease in milk yield and fat content, and increased susceptibility to infections like pneumonia in lambs. 
With herds of domestic livestock, um, stock owners can easily supplement them with trace minerals by the use of mineral blocks that can be purchased at local feed stores. And these are really important to keep domestic livestock healthy. Um, but however, bighorn sheep and wild ungulates actually have to rely on past knowledge of reliable mineral sources. And they can be natural like these rams ingesting soil on the left here, or of anthropogenic source like these ewes who are attempting to ingest um, de-icing salt compounds that accumulate on roadways. So these next few slides, I'm going to give a few examples of what confirmed um, mineral licks that are used by bighorn sheep and mountain goats look like. And these, these will be some examples of the natural sources, not necessarily the roadside sources. So the site so shown here is actually on the Beartooth Plateau down in southern Montana. And we can see Dr. Bob Garrett right here in the lick site itself. So you can see it's not a very large area. There's a pretty prominent contrast between the vegetation, like this typical vegetation of the plateau and this bare patch of soil. At this same Beartooth site, there was of several depressions such as these and excavations in the soil where the animals have been pawing at the soil in order to um, eat the soil. And that's what this word geophagy means. It just means the ingestion of soil or mineral licks. Um, here's a few other examples of what signs of intense geophagy can look like these natural lick sites. On the left, we have a site in Wyoming and it might be a bit hard to see, but there are actually teeth marks in the soil here where ewes have been scraping to get some soil away from that wall there. And then on the right is a sample of goat scat from Glacier National Park that is comprised almost completely of was found in the adjacent to one of the large lick sites in the park there. So these wild ungulates aren't using these lick sites um, regularly throughout the year. There is a bit of seasonality to them. The highest use being um, after the green up of vegetation, when the animals switch from their dry winter forage to succulent green forage in the spring and the summer. This succulent forage is high in potassium, which can consequently, an increase of potassium intake consequently causes a loss of electrolytes like sodium and magnesium, which can form a need for these animals to go visit lick sites to remedy that, those deficiencies. This spring and summer lick use also coincides with the demands of lactation and regaining body fat lost during the winter months. So to evaluate our hypothesis of summer migrations, we actually viewed the GPS collar locations of the, the use in our five study herds um, in a GIS and on Google Earth imagery. So what we did for this was we first identified the time period when the animals were on their high elevation summer range, which was what those thick red lines on that herd wide elevational profile was showing us earlier. We then only selected the summer locations for the sheep that were at or below the lowest 10th percentile elevation and buffered each of these by 50 meters. And this 50 meter buffer was to account for any sort of lags or errors within the GPS data, as well as to capture those individuals who were either on their way to a lick site or um, leaving it. After we buffered each of those locations, we merged any overlapping buffer polygons to create larger polygons. And we took only those polygons containing five or more locations of one or more individual to then view on the satellite imagery in Google Earth. In Google Earth, we were looking for physical characteristics of like known or natural like sites like trailing networks, bare soil, eroded slopes, and proximity to roadsides. If those were present, we tagged that polygon as a potential lick site. And this last point here, we actually just finished up this phase last month in October, where we visited quite a few of the potential lick sites that we um, found per each herd, and we are waiting on the soil sample analysis for that now. Um, if that was a little bit hard to visualize, I will go through these methods with pictures and a few slides. But first, I just want to show you kind of some of the physical characteristics that would key us in to a site being a potential lick site. So in panel A here on the left, we actually have that same bare tooth plateau site that um, I mentioned earlier. It's again, a pretty obvious distinction between the vegetation of the surrounding landscape and this bare soil. Um, panel B is a road cut on side of dirt road here. Again, it's a pretty prominent difference between the surrounding landscape. Panel C is a really nice example of a really prominent trail network 
you can see that these animals are using this bare patch of soil as the lick site in the middle, and there is a ton of really prominent trails leading to and going away from the lick. And finally, our last panel here, panel D, is showing um, a lick site that's actually an eroded riverbank with quite a bit of trailing on the right side of the picture here. So to go through these methods, we kind of used this known lick site here that was in the range of our castle reef study herd as an example. Um, here we can see the typical bare soil and a pretty good trail network just around this lick site here. So next we've put the GPS locations, the low elevation summer locations of the ewes in this herd on top of the lick. And I believe there are eight ewes represented in this photo here. Next, we have our merged buffer polygons around these locations. And we can see that this is just a snapshot of a much larger polygon. And here is the polygon as a whole. Um, and this really demonstrates the necessity for us to go through and look pretty in depth at each of these larger polygons because even a known lick site like this could be hidden within one of a larger polygon. And um, we were looking for really dense clustering of locations like this, as well as the physical characteristics on the satellite imagery to really key us in to what could be a potential mineral lick site. So through this, um, we found that each herd had quite a few polygons this first column here that had five or more locations of one or more individual, but only about a third or less of those polygons had the physical characteristics that could represent a potential lick site. And then we saw similar median numbers of individuals represented per polygon with a bit less in the upper Yellowstone herd and a similar number between each herd for locations represented per polygon with quite a few more in the Stillwater herd. So several of our potential lick sites um, had really dense clusters of locations like this one from the Castle Reef herd. You can see, I think there were, there were six individuals, six collared ewes represented in this polygon here, but there are significantly more than six locations recorded, meaning that these individuals are visiting this site several times during the summer season. Um, again, we can see the typical bare soil of a lick site and what seems to be an ephemeral pond over on the right here. A few of the potential lick sites that we identified were seemingly of anthropogenic origin, like this site at the Stillwater Mine. I believe this is kind of a rock dump area where these bighorn ewes in the Stillwater herd are really keying in on. There are seven collared ewes represented in this snapshot here. So again, they're visiting this several times per season. And we can see again that this is a, just a snapshot of a much larger polygon highlighting the need for us to go through and look in depth for clusters of locations like this. Um, we also identified quite a few sites where we could physically see salt blocks in satellite imagery. It might be a little bit hard to see here, but this white dot where my mouse and the push pin is um, located is a salt block that is closely tied with a private residence. And the bighorn sheep ewes in our herds are keying in on these areas as reliable sources of minerals. So after we were all said and done with um, describing these potential lick site polygons, we went through each of our collared ewes in our herds and connected consecutive locations to create paths to see like which routes they took to and from the lick sites back to summer range. And what we found through this was that the summer migrations were pretty short. They were maybe only a few days apiece, but in some cases they were quite long. I think typically each summer migration event was maybe three or four kilometers round trip, but we actually found one in which an individual U traveled 68 kilometers round trip from her summer range to a potential excite polygon and back to summer range. So even though these pathways can be pretty long, um, they are pretty directed. So these ewes are really keying in on a resource that they want. They're not making much of a walkabout in their routes. They're heading straight to it and straight back up to summer range. And what's more is that we saw these travel routes commonly led the ewes through densely forested areas like this yellow and red path here of two different ewes in our Lost Creek herd. And in some cases, like in this photo, um, ewes were actually having to cross roads. This, it's a little hard to see, but cutting through the center of this photo here is Montana Highway 1 near Anaconda. 
So these ewes are actually crossing a highway twice to get to this lick site and back to their summer range. Again, in this still water herd, um, we have three pathways from three different ewes here, and all three of them have taken similar paths through this densely timbered slopey area to get to that potential lick site on the mine. These migrating ewes are likely commonly accompanied by their lambs, and several published papers have documented a loss of lambs when traveling to and from the lick sites in the summer. So in order for us to actually test whether these potential lick sites were in fact sources of trace minerals for these sheep, we had to go out and collect soil at 17 known lick sites um, throughout Montana and Wyoming just to get kind of a baseline of what mineral lick soil concentrations are like in this region of North America. Each of our 17 licks are shown on this map as red triangles and we assayed for um, seven trace minerals which were sodium, calcium, magnesium, phosphorus, copper, selenium, and zinc. While we did test for seven trace minerals, the three in these tables, so calcium, magnesium, and sodium, um, were actually in the highest concentrations in licks used by bighorn sheep and mountain goats and are required in the highest amounts by domestic sheep. So, during our study, we visited these 17 known lick sites, but we also additionally found 30 lick sites that were used by mountain goats and bighorn sheep in the literature. And from this, we can see that the licks that we found in our study or visited in our study um, had a wider range in concentrations in parts per million. And were generally, the median was higher than those in the literature, except for magnesium, it was a bit lower. So what we overall found was that um, natural forage on their high elevation summer ranges of bighorn sheep are routinely deficient in the essential trace minerals, which is causing bighorn sheep use to remedy these deficiencies by making these short duration, long distance migrations to either natural or anthropogenic mineral lick sites. Um, these licks are an important habitat feature for um, bighorn sheep populations and are likely required to maintain individual animal health and overall population demographic vigor as a whole. And summer migrations by use with lambs can likely increase the risk of predation and other sources of mortality such as vehicle collisions. And lastly, um, some thoughts for management is that it may be valuable to map and inventory lick sites to identify them as important habitat features. Um, and to share this lick site information with multiple land managers around the area to aid in the conservation of movement corridors to and from seasonal ranges to potential lick sites. Um, when it, reintroducing bighorn sheep to new areas, it could be worth it to consider establishing artificial licks in areas where sheep sheep summer to ensure that they have access to trans essential trace minerals and to deter them from traveling too far from their reintroduction area. And in addition, it could also be worth to considering establishing artificial licks on the summer ranges of established bighorn sheep herds if known summer migrations occur and the herd has chronic poor lamb and ewe ratios. Again, this can deter the need of those ewes with lambs to travel through those forested areas with a higher risk of predation and to deter them from crossing any roads. Um, with that, I would like to very much thank everybody who has helped and has continued to help on this project, particularly the Wild Sheep Foundation, Montana State University, and Sitka Gear for project funds, and every single person on this list who came out with me to dig in the dirt and, or provided us with mineralic locations or permitting access. And with that, I think I'm ready for some questions. Thank you. Thanks, Emma. Um, that was a great presentation and uh, it's quite clear the ewes are willing to travel long distances and through really uh, risky terrain at times with their lambs to visit the licks and we're running a little over but we have one question so we can we can answer that question. Marco says excellent work Emma. Do you know if lactation status affected lick use? Um, That's a really good question. So I don't know if use that didn't have lambs and weren't lactating were using licks less or more than those who were lactating but um i mean to in order to have like a, a sufficient milk supply for lambs calcium is pre, is required in some high amounts for to keep that milk fat and milk content 
coming through for the lambs. So I think that this is just a speculation, but I would think that lamb or ewes who are lactating would probably use, um, use licks more and maybe stay at the licks for a longer duration. Okay, thank you. We'll move on here and you can share your screen.